Welcome to the Big Screen Symposium 2018 podcast. The Big Screen Symposium took place in Auckland on the 26th and 27th of October. Please note, while many of the speakers used clips in their sessions, we've edited these out to better suit the podcast. Stray is the debut feature film from award-winning writer, director, producer Dustin Fennelly and producer Desiree Armstrong. In this session, Dustin and Desiree discuss how Stray was financed as an independent film, focusing on securing private investment and their record-breaking crowdfunding campaign. They'll also explore the entrepreneurial skills, drive and tenacity needed to succeed as independent filmmakers. I'm Desiree. <laughs> and uh, I'm Dustin. And we um, have made a film called Stray, so we just wanted to, I guess, share what our experience has been in the making of it. It's, it's definitely not a template. We question whether it's even sustainable, but we embarked on it in the way that we did because we were deeply passionate about telling the story and this was the avenue that was available to us to do so. So we just wanted to share that with you and hopefully you can get some takeaways from it. The uh, thing would be that, you know, we made a very unashamedly art house film. Mm. One of the reasons why we don't really see what we're going to do in this case study as a template for necessarily other filmmakers or content creators is that the very particular specific genre and style of film it is might not be relevant to all of you in terms of your own films you have made or aspirations for further projects. Uh, having said that, we do think there is going to be some useful stuff. And if we didn't, we would be saying go to the other session right now. <laughs> so I'm going to just kick off with, with a bit of a um, project timeline. The point of this is that it was a 10-year journey, essentially. So basically, I'm the uh, writer, director of the film, and um, I also ended up being a producer on the film as well, and Desiree is the lead producer on the film. Basically, the background is that uh, I had the first idea for the film in 2008. At that point, it was just like a mere kernel, a vague sense of something really... Uh, nebulous like any writer in this room would understand. I didn't really know that there was necessarily a film there, let alone a feature-length film. And it wasn't until 2011 when I had a screenplay. Uh, at, the, at the beginning of 2011, I had an actual first draft screenplay that was about 90 pages. And then what I felt... Um, was that at that point uh, there was no producer attached, it was just me, um, and the only person that I showed it to at that point was someone who's a key collaborator, has been for a long time and continues to be a close friend of mine, Ari Wegner, who is the cinematographer of the film, and she was the only person that I showed these sketches of scenes to. It was really, um, I was feeling it out, and I really only trusted Ari to give me feedback because it was such a nebulous thing and it was such a particular type of film. So then uh, basically what I decided was that I'd heard that there were things like the Sundance Lab, the Binger Film Lab and the Cannes Film Festival Screenwriting Residence. So I thought that it might be good, given that I was trying to make this unashamedly art house film, that it might be appropriate to try and get into one of those things. So basically in May 2011, uh, I was shortlisted for the Bingham Film Lab, which doesn't exist anymore, but did exist in Amsterdam, was an amazing place. I got shortlisted, did the Skype, and even though I only submitted a first draft screenplay, they said on the Skype that they loved it so much that they didn't think it was appropriate for the writer's lab, that it was too developed already. So it was kind of like being told you're overqualified for a job that you really, really want. So that was like the first rejection that um, I experienced making the film. And then basically... I then, in July of that year, shortlisted for the Cannes Film Festival residence in Paris. I got flown to Paris for 48 hours. There were nine filmmakers shortlisted for six places from around the world, and you had a 30-minute meeting to, to pitch it to these people, and at 5 p.m. they said, you're going to get a phone call. I was wandering the streets of Paris, and then I got this phone call saying, uh, hello, Dustin, thank you very much for coming all this way from New Zealand. We love your script, but unfortunately, uh, we're not selecting you. So then basically... I got, came back. But the thing with the writer's lab at the Binger is they said, I think that this might be better for the director's lab. So I applied for the director's lab at the Binger, was selected at the end of 2011, and then I did that in April, July 2012. So that, 
being an experience at director's lab was really, really pivotal to the development because essentially what they do is it's like five months, uh, eight filmmakers, uh, first features. They bring in, you know, I don't know, Molly Stensgaard, who's Lars von Trier's picture editor, but she's also uh, a screenplay consultant, an amazing script editor. Then they bring Judith Weston from LA, who wrote the book on directing actors for the screen. And so they bring in all these amazing mentors. And then at, at the end of that process, I really, really integ I mean, they basically interrogated the hell out of the script. And they also made me realize what my voice as a filmmaker was, like what it is that's unique about the way my sensibility as a filmmaker um, that I wasn't really conscious of until I did that lab. So it was a very uh, personally and professionally, creatively, an amazing experience. It's a shame that that place doesn't exist anymore. But basically, out of that, I must have done a couple more drafts. But I also started to think about really how I wanted to direct the film. And if you've seen the film, uh, you'll know that it is what some people call a very lean screenplay. It's very minimalist. There's not much dialogue. And so I was basically coming out of that going, I know how I'm going to direct the film, what the, vi the cinematic vision for the film is. So yes, and about the time of uh, July 11, 2011, doing the Cannes Residence, I found a producer. Um, at that time, Philip Campbell was the producer. And so throughout this um, script development period of, you know, the Binger and uh, we, you know, applied to NZFC and we got EDF funding and then we went to Cinemart, uh, which is part of the International Film Festival Rotterdam's co-production market. The relevant thing to say about Cinemart was that we could already feel in a market sense that the, the tide was turning in a way in terms of uh, art house films in the sense that we got a lot of interest at Cinemart from, say, top-tier sales agents like The Match Factory, who, who would have been, you know, my dream sales agent for this film. Um, and, well, I'll get to that later, but essentially there was a lot of heat, and at that time it was going to be, uh, you know, potentially um, a $2.3 million film co-production. You know, it was a much bigger, bigger film, budget-wise. Then... We got ADF funding, and then essentially around that time, um, the market and also the feedback uh, from the commission was that for this kind of film, for a debut feature, execution dependent, art house, et cetera, et cetera, that it should be more around or un just under the $1 million mark. So then basically, Philippa and I felt that it would be better if um, I was to move on with the project with a young and hungry project, someone that was closer to my stage of career. And so essentially at the beginning, around the beginning of 2014, I met with a, a handful of producers and then um, teamed up with Desiree. Over to Desiree. <laughs> well, we were professionally dating for a couple of months. Uh, Dustin actually approached me, sent me an email, told me that he had this project, sent me the script and I mean, I mean, you can hear the way Dustin speaks, the passion, um, and you can see in the trailer. Um, and in the graphic design of this piece, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, before he said it was lean, it, it, in dialogue, it, it, it's, it's a very minimal film, but on the page it actually read quite big, and it really spoke to me, you know? It's a story about two people who are just trying to connect, and I think we can connect with that. I mean, the writing was incredible. Anyway, we met up a few times, talked a hell of a lot and yeah, normally I work in a short film space because I think that's a really good way to, I guess, date directors before you marry them in a feature sense and you get to know their good points and their bad points and likewise with me, but you can suss each other out. Dustin and I didn't have that. I definitely feel like in our conversations we're on the same page. Um, like you said, we're at similar stages in our career. You know, we'd worked in a short film space and we're ready to kind of lean into features. So, yeah, I guess it was perfect project, perfect timing, but more than anything, it was Dustin's tenacity. Like, I just had this absolute belief on first meeting that he was going to do what he said he was going to do. And that's the perfect collaborator for me, you know. Um, I'll work equally as hard with someone that, that does as well and, and that was 
plainly obvious. And so, and, con and conversely, no, the same, whatever. For my, from my point of view, um, the thing that really, amongst other things that really stood out about Desiree was like, even though at that point we really didn't know how we were going to make the film and it was completely on spec, it was completely speculative, I just felt that she was in it for the long haul, no matter how hard it turned out to be. We didn't know that then. Well, no, <laughs> we knew, that, we knew yeah. that it wasn't going to be easy. Yeah. We could read the tea leaves to know enough that it wasn't going to be easy. And I trusted your conviction in seeing it through no matter what. And we couldn't have predicted how hard it was mm. going to be and how much we were going to learn as we went. And no one needs to hear all that crap. Yeah, but this is, uh, thank you. This yeah, is lovely. Yeah, yeah. Um, once I came on board, we had a jam about how we were going to approach this. At the same time, Script to Screen put out a call for uh, film up applications, uh, and we both applied to that. I don't know if we actually knew that we were both applying. No, I don't think we even did. Yeah. Anyway, we both, we both applied, yeah. and we both did it together, which I think was maybe a new thing for them, and they were maybe a little bit worried. Esther was like, is this going to be okay with you guys? It was perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, it's such an awesome peer support environment. Um, having professional peers at a similar stage in career that you can be vulnerable with. And, you know, you, you have this uh, idea that everyone's got their stuff sorted, that they, that, you know, everyone knows what they're doing. And it was such a wicked environment to be in, to go, I don't know how to do this, or have you been in a situation where this and, um, yeah, we had an awesome group of people who um, have ended up being really amazing friends, particularly because in that time, Dustin and I were trying to package the film. We, we cast our two leads. Yeah. Um, Should we just talk on that? Yeah, yeah, do leads? you want to talk about so, that? So, yeah, so basically the film is a two-hander beyond the beautiful cinematography and the amazing Otago mm. locations. The film is essentially a two-hander, so we knew that we needed to cast two amazing actors. So in terms of that package, in terms of the talent, um, because at that point it was, you know, myself, Des, and Ari Wegner attached as DP, so we had those three key people at that point. Um, so we went about casting the two leads. The first uh, actor we cast was Arda Dabroshi, who plays Grace. She was in a film that I love by the Dardenne brothers called Lorna Silence. I loved that film. I wrote her a love letter, just offered her the role. We hadn't Skyped or emailed before. And, you know, we only had to wait like two weeks. Yeah. And her agent said, yep, she'll do it. So we had her. That was awesome. And then we did a more traditional casting process for the lead actor of Jack. Uh, we auditioned uh, over 200 young actors in the kind of 18 to 25-year-old age range. And, in fact, we cast Yula Kowale, who's not the guy in the film, if any of you have seen it. So that is the actor that we cast at that time. Then we went about in terms of this, right? Yeah, well, we, I mean, we needed to build a package and um, I guess a plan, really, and a roadmap. And so uh, we reached out to market partners. We looked for distribution. We saw a sales agent. We teamed up with Brett from Queenstown Cameras, who's been a big supporter of this film from a very long time ago. We teamed up with Park Road Post. Sorry, I get a bit emotional because we've asked so much of so many people in... <laughs> This is embarrassing. That's all right. <laughs> let it out. Let it out. Oh, it wasn't a fucking just... <laughs> easy road. Like, it wasn't an easy road. We, we, I mean, at every turn, we asked a lot of people. And so many people said no, but so many people said yes. So I apologise for being a bit emotional, but I looked at you, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> Brett makes me cry quite a bit. Um, <laughs> Just kidding. We, we needed people. We, we needed supporters. And in a big way, Park Road came on board. Queenstown Cameras came on board. We secured HODs. We, we were trying to build a real tight package. And even when we were preparing the application for the Film Commission, we thought we'd done a good job, actually. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, we applied for production investment and were successful. That's the short version of that story. <laughs> uh, basically... <laughs> um, so that's just the historical truth. And yeah. What we want to talk about is actually how we made the film because yeah. we hope that in terms of private equity and crowdfunding, that's something that's useful to people regardless of the style and content and genre you're working in. What it did do was challenge our commitment to the film, or certainly mine. Yeah. You know, at that point, it was like, oh, well, they've said no, so what are you going to do? You know, yeah. you either make it or you don't, and that certainly cemented my commitment to you and the film. But pretty much from that kind of May, June, July, mid-2015 period, we had no idea 
we were very unsure, uncertain, depressed, et cetera, as you would be. And then what happened was I went to see uh, Bueller, the guy that was cast in the film, an Auckland Theatre Company production of Silo Play, The Events, I think it was called. Anyway, in intermission, I was looking at the program and in the back was a list of names of people that financially contribute towards and donate. Um, it was either Silo or ATC, I can't really remember, or maybe both. And that was my eureka moment where I was like, this is how we can make this fucking film happen. Because as you would have seen at the sessions on the back of all those chairs at ATC, there are names of people, right? So essentially, that was like, we want to make this really bold, rigorous art house film. Who are the people in New Zealand that might back that venture? And so we essentially tapped into the patrons of the arts community in New Zealand. So they are people that give to the Auckland Theatre Company, the ballet, the opera, the art gallery, you know. And so that was really like, shit, there could be a way. Yeah. We know nothing about private equity investment and we know nothing about crowdfunding, but these are the people that might back this vision. So we prepared a document that it set out to show potential investors, what we were pitching to them, what was the undertaking, how we were going to make it, how we were going to finance it, what we were asking of them. It was an ask, basically. It took a couple of months, actually. Yeah, so with the help of our lawyer, Tim Riley, and some senior producers that gave advice on yeah. the crafting of this document, that took a couple of months. And then also simultaneous to that, what we did is basically look, because it's in the public domain of all the people that who, unless it's anonymous, or the people that um, financially contribute towards every arts organisation or performing arts organisation in New Zealand. And we found those people's contact details, about 2,000 people, and we called 2,000 people. And then essentially phoning them, because they're busy people, I essentially had a pitch that was about four minutes long, and all I really wanted to do was say, can I send you this PDF for you to read about this project? I do just want to say oh, yeah. um, one note about this is part oh, yeah. of the Securities Act. You, you need to be really careful about this, you know. Yeah. You can't just hit up Nana down the no. road. It needs to be public that they are individuals of high net worth, that they are used to this environment. If you're, if you're going out to target people who might be swayed when they don't have the capacity to invest, then you get into really tricky territory. Yeah. So that was a very clear legal advice that we sought from our lawyer. That's why the document is called an investment opportunity, not a prospectus. If this is a pathway that you are possibly might do, you definitely need good legal advice. But the people that we were ringing had proven that they were arts patrons. They had the capacity to donate or invest in an artistic project such as Stray. So I just want to say Yeah, that. totally. So they only need a proven history in film investment specifically, or they need to um, financially contribute towards arts ventures or arts projects is kind of the, kind of the thing. And then we only contacted people like that. We weren't calling grandma or anything. Yeah. Oh, I should just say that, like most producers, we're not going to disclose throughout this exact numbers because they're commercially sensitive. It's still at the box office, etc. So the cash hard cost budget of this film is under half a million dollars. So essentially have like a one pager that is like what we're all about. And this was trying to raise private equity investment. And we initially thought, we hoped that the, um, the, the minimum cash hard cost budget that we'd formulated that we could raise all of it through private equity investment. We never even thought we would do a crowdfunding campaign, which I guess some people who are coming to this session may know about Stray before it screened anywhere was because through the crowdfunding campaign or boosted. But initially, we were hoping that we could just all do it through private equity. From our application from the NZFC, we had a model, and that model changed when we needed to make it independently. So we revised that model, we did a budget, there were a number of assumptions in that budget, and a lot of it was based on relationships that we had with industry, with cast and crew, with suppliers, and a lot of bloody goodwill. What we were asking for in terms of cash budget is not what a film costs. That's what made it an artistic project, I, I guess, other than the artistry, also the approach. This, we weren't in commercial territory anymore. We're in 
we, we, there's, a, there's, a, there's a director with a vision and he has something to say and people should hear that and see that. So what we were asking was a tiny amount, really, in the scheme of things, and those budget assumptions are really important because they are they're human. Um, the line items in a budget, but they are the relationships that you build and people who can see what you're trying to do, yeah, um, and, and belief and backing in either the people or the artistic merits of a project. So this document really was an explanation, a foot in the door. So this document really, hopefully, was a compelling read about what we were trying to do. And we were conscious that there's a stigma attached to low-budget films, so one of the yeah. questions in our fact was, will the film look or sound low-budget? And we said, no, because of the backing of Brett and Queenstown cameras, we're going to be able to shoot on the Alexa. And so we're not shooting it on standard deaf video or whatever. We're shooting on a high-end camera, beautiful lenses. We're going to be doing the mix and the grade at Park Road Post, a yeah. world-class facility, because we knew that in the public sense, like, there is a stigma attached to low budget. And it's like, well, it'll just look cheap. But we were also saying, of course, that, you know, the, 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 the locations, because we fought to make it not in the backyards of Auckland, but down in central and... Queenstown, Central Otago, North Otago. So there's obviously instant, amazing, beautiful production values mm. because of those locations as well. Regardless of the budget, that was always our intention. And the only thing low budget about the film is the budget. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really proud of that, you know. Um, <coughs> uh, you, you, the film is screened in festivals and with budgets, millions of dollars, and it holds up in... I think that's a really great achievement, Dustin. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> for the whole team who made the yeah. film. And so then we've got, you know, will the film, obviously in a document like this, will the film return on investment? You have to explain that, that as everyone knows, film investment is in, inherently risky. Mm. Essentially, we won't go into the recruitment waterfall and the figures, but we were offering all private investors first position, pro rata pari passu, meaning like proportion to how much they put in. Uh, we can say that we had uh, about about 15 individual yeah. investors, and the, the lowest investment amount was about $5,000, and I think the highest was $50,000. Then, you know, talking about, is there an audience for the film? Yes, and we can speak about the release of the film now and how our conviction from the beginning that there was an audience for this film, despite it being considered niche and art house, has proved to be correct. And then, you know, we're just bullet pointing, like, why we think you should invest in this film. A strong script, clear vision, two excellent actors, experienced team, in kind, blah, blah, blah. Um, what's in it for me? There's a, t there, you know, is my investment tax deductible? Yes, DS1 of the Income Tax Act means that, you know, if it's complete loss, you can write off mm. some of that. Though it's saying, you know, here's Arta, here's Bueller, who was originally cast, and then I've got to skip that. <laughs> um, I am going to now, uh, you know, there was a synopsis. They could read the script if they want to. Weirdly enough, only two of our investors ever requested the screenplay uh, to read in full. Um, one of the things, is, so there's my direct statement, story and theme, why I want to make the film, uh, you know, what, what, what it means to me, the style and tone, talking about the actors, the locations and production design, and then the genre. And uh, there's like weird looking back at these comps, because I hate comps. But, you know, like I was saying, Shame, Blue Valentine, mm -hmm. Rust and Bone, then other films that are in, you know, Wrestler, 21 Grams, Paris, Texas, Wendy and Lucy, um, Rosetta, blah, 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 blah. But one of the things in terms of, like, the feedback that we got, both in terms of private investors and then in terms of crowdfunding donors who have now seen the film at the festival or in cinemas, one of the things we keep hearing is, like, how they believe we really delivered on the artistic vision yeah. and technical excellence that we said we would. Like, that's a really key thing that we keep hearing, and we're really, really proud of that, and we're proud of the whole team, that we pulled off what we said we were going to. And it was very important, even in terms of the marketing, the weird trailer you just saw, where there's one line of dialogue, you know, that, that, that at all levels, we be honest about the film that we're making. We weren't trying to hoodwink anyone that it's like, you know, um, more action-packed than it is. It's a slow-burn, minimalist film, and we 
always wanted to convey yeah. that. As I was, you know, writing and preparing the film, I always collect photographs. And so we made this booklet that we gave to people at market, that we gave to our investors so that they could get a feel for beyond the script or whatever, what... The atmosphere. The atmosphere, the look, the tone and the feel. And so given I was collecting these photos over years of script development, um, these are the photos that we're showing because you're trying to pitch and convey the artistic vision of the film beyond a screenplay. And arguably, because it's an unusual screenplay in that, that it's quite lean and there's not, you know, people don't say that much, I really felt that these kind of supplementary materials are not only integral to my development or, or process as a director, but also into conveying even to key team members, you know, the cinematographer, production mm -hmm. designer, etc., the kind of um, atmosphere and the, and the soul of the film as much as you can pulling from other people's photography or artwork. That's essentially that. When I was at Bingham Film Lab in 2012, I did a test scene of Grace's first scene in the film. This is Grace's opening scene in the film, working with a Dutch actress for the day, and it's all one take, long scene of dialogue, shot like that profile. Four years later, in Otago, this becomes the final scene of the film, which is slightly wider, but it starts with an opening frame. She walks in, <coughs> makes a phone call with a different actress, and that's that. So basically, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, from the beginning, mm. there was a consistency of vision and there was a clarity of communication in that vision to potential investors and crowdfunding donors. We recognised that there was going to be a gap between the minimum hard cash budget we needed and what private investment we secured. So kind of reluctantly, in all, in all honesty, looked to crowdfunding. And I say reluctantly because that is putting yourself out there. That is asking, that is, that is showing a need. Like, we needed it. And in a very public way, you're, 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 you're putting your shit out there. Like, we're trying to do this. We're asking for help. Please help us. So we did a lot of research, actually, about what platform was the best way to go. I think Tyker and Jermaine, they did a really successful Kickstarter campaign for the rollout of theatrical release in the States. So that looked interesting. And then we ultimately decided on Boosted because they offer a 33% rebate on all donations, which is amazing, really. And the other reason why that kind of the whole crowdfunding thing came up was not only the gap from private equity, but also many of those people who said, oh, I can't invest, yeah. or I don't want to invest a large amount, or if my accountant says I shouldn't invest in a film, etc. They were like, but I would say donate $1,000. And there were a number and number of people that were saying that. And so we felt that, wow, like if we have an avenue, a platform yeah. for to people to contribute, to. then this could be quite a successful crowdfunding campaign. And also boosted beyond the tax credit also because it's run by the Arts Foundation of New Zealand, which is why you can get the 33% yeah. tax credit. A lot of the people that we were cold calling that we had no connections to initially, that kind of arts patrons community of New Zealand, they are heavily involved with the Arts Foundation of New Zealand and therefore they're very familiar with Boosted, so they trust that platform. We initially set the target at $75,000. It's an all or nothing platform. Um, at that time, I can't remember, but Already, when we were going for 75000 that was the largest target ever for an arts project. The average is on, on boosted target is about five to $10,000. And so, you know, it was very scary and risky because none yeah. of us had any experience in crowdfunding, even $5,000. So it was kind of frightening uh, whether it was going to succeed. And even boosted were nervous about such a large target. But we just knew that there was this gap in private equity and that if we didn't get at least 75, then we couldn't we even shoot lighter. on the bones budget that we ultimately, you know, had. Everyone knows that you, apparently you can't do a successful crowdfunding campaign unless you do a video appeal. It's the most awkward thing. We spent a day. <coughs> we spent a day. Like neither dust. I mean, this is, this is new territory for me. Like this is so unfamiliar. Not my jam at all. And that was way worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
so um, it was interesting. But we really felt it was necessary to personalise the ask. You know, if we were expecting people to, or asking people to donate, the least we could frickin' do was put yourself on camera and ask the question. So the other thing that it rolls into, as you'll see, is it goes into a locations mood reel. So in the years leading up to the shoot in development, in script development, I was going down uh, on my own, get a hire car for two weeks and drive all around Otago and try and find the locations to film. So, like, I knew she needed to find a job, but I didn't know where. And then I found this amazing uh, sawmill timber yard in Luggett, and I was like, fuck, this place, this is an amazing location. This is where she should try and get a job. And it's also when, you know, the film was, like, flailing to get financed, I always also found those trips incredibly, it reinvigorated me and kept me passionate and, and it reminded me why I wanted to make the film and also why I was fighting for it to be down in Otago, which of course, on our budget, was going to be more expensive than if we'd shot in, like if I'd set the whole film in Grey Lynn. I mean, I could have made the film about two alienated, damaged strangers connecting in Grey Lynn, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like, so basically, because I was collecting those photos, we made that into a Koshin's mood reel a lot of those places we ended up, you know, shooting in those places and uh, it, it, I think, was an effective way of giving people a sense of the landscape we were going to f uh, shoot in and also um, tonally, uh, even though, ironically, the film doesn't have a musical score, um, that music is a shortcut way of um, giving people a sense mm -hmm. of the, the mood of the film. Um, now, I guess one of the things, um, like, people have often asked, like, how did you, you know, how did you get that target? Because, you know, in 13 days we hit 75K and then we upped it. And then uh, in 30 days we got to 125K in, like, the last friggin' 10 yeah. minutes or something. Um, and we, so Boosted usually say that for a 30-day campaign you need 30 days of prep and outreach and comms. We basically did about uh, seven months so by the time we went live in April 2016, mm -hmm. we had started the process back in October because, as I said, a lot of those people that didn't necessarily invest, they did become, you know, key high-level donors. Um, and then also, obviously, that's that community that were complete strangers to us. But then, of course, there were family and friends and particularly a shitload of Industry. Our film community. And yeah, so many industry people supported this film financially, donated to it. I'd also like to add that uh, a lot of individuals from the Film Commission donated yeah. as well, which was quite moving. Um, but yeah, it was our film community that really, everyone was sharing it. Uh, <coughs> it, it was truly humbling. But it did, like, you know, like the work behind the scenes, like it was, um, man, like it was like at times, I reckon the month before and the month of, yeah. it was a full-time job. Yeah. It, it was a full-time job to, to try and... Because, you know, like they say, I think uh, the rule is that someone who's predisposed to donate to your project, you need to remind them three times. And, like, because people are time poor and busy and stuff, and you catch people, the, the day you send the email going, oh, we're now at 30% of our target, they could be changing their baby's nappy or making lunch or whatever. And so, you know, then they forget about it. And so even someone who's predisposed, as in the project's their personal taste, they want to support it, they're your auntie, whatever, they often need two or three reminders mm -hmm. to actually sit down and go, oh, yeah, that's right, I was going to donate to that. So we were quite rigorous. Yeah, it does go against uh, a Kiwi sensibility, though. You know, you don't want to be a pain. Sorry yeah. to bother you, uh, but it is a um, friendly reminder. You know, it's a fine line, actually, between uh, being uh, not persistent, but like, just checking in uh, to being a pain in the ass, and we didn't want to be that. So we were really uh, careful about our comms. Um, the other thing is that, like we did with our investors or potential investors, uh, we had, and I also want to mention um, our two associate producers, Cez um, and Alex, uh, were instrumental in this. It wasn't just Dustin and I. No. Uh, the four of us, uh, we built a database of all of our friends and family, all yeah. of our industry contacts, um, people that we met the other day at the pub, you know, whatever. But it was a collective Google Doc of everybody that we knew. 
we set up uh, MailChimp and yeah. we uh, were very clear about our comms, when we were going to remind them. And we um, made notes, like there were so many yeah. notes every time we phoned someone and they didn't answer or we left a message or there was always that all of us could share. That's Alex, says Des and I, the four of us, we knew like, okay, that person has said no, they're not interested. Yeah, they're, don't they're send them now another read, email. Do not call them again, <laughs> do not annoy them again, or that person's warm but they need time to think about it or mm. whatever. And so it was very systematic and rigorous and disciplined and we treated it like a job, you know. Yeah. We did. You had to, to, to get the level of private equity and the level of crowdfunding donors. You, we did. It couldn't be a casual thing. We were just never going to reach that target if it was casual. Um, and that's actually been the whole approach, the entire process. It's, it's definitely been a job <laughs> um, in a wonderful way. One of the things I just wanted to say as well is like you've got to be um, like thick skinned. So I remember when I was calling a lot of people, mm. on average, um, maybe about a quarter of people would say, yeah, okay, you can send me the PDF. So three quarters of people were just like, nah, not interested, bye. <laughs> um, and so you, it's, it's kind of, I think, well, in terms of the approach we did, it is a numbers game. You know what I mean? It's a numbers game. And even the people that accept it to read the PDF, they may never read it. And even those that do, they may go like, oh, this is like, you know, I'm not interested in this. Like, I'd invest in pork pie, but I'm not going to invest in this, you know? So artistically, personal taste-wise, there's going to be a lot of people that even, if they think, oh, that's a, quite a considerable 30-page PDF, mm. these guys have put a lot of time into it. They just go, oh, I wouldn't, I, I'm not interested in that kind of film. So inherently are going to receive, as much as amazing support as we received from all sorts of people, for every support, there was lots of rejection. Or not rejection, but just like people that weren't interested, I guess. Yeah, I mean, throughout the whole course of this uh, process, we've got a lot of rejection, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, that's the thing. You know? Oh, that we, brings me to the day we hit yeah. 125K in the crowdfunding, we get a call that our lead actor, Buell, is pulling out. So um, that was like, I remember like the biggest anti-climax <laughs> to our green light. We'd green lit the film gun, financially, gun. but we lost our lead actor due to availability. So then... Which is awesome for his career. I mean, that guy's flying and uh, definitely no animosity. It just, it just didn't work on, out on the day. Um, because that's the thing we didn't say from the beginning is like we'd, and I think it was a really good thing to do, like line the sand or what's the thing when you sake in the ground? Sake in the ground, we said no matter what happens, we're going to shoot 1st of August yeah. 2016. We just put this, well, it's not arbitrary, it's a winter film, it needed to be at least. Or, but, but what I mean is, what I mean is, what I mean is, like, we really, it was a bit mad in the sense that it was a risk. If right? we were ever going to make it, that was the yeah, time. Because it had been like, the idea had been my head by that time for like eight years. And I was like, I'm going to get sick of this film if we don't yeah. shoot. I'd like to just move on. Um, and so we did that, and then everything in terms of the private equity and the crowd, time of the crowdfunding campaign was all, all gearing up towards to be able to hopefully turn over on 1st of August. As mm. it turned out, we shot one day early on July 31st. Yeah. But then what essentially, we had lost our actor and then, then went into massive, and because I'd seen so many actors, um, I was freaking, well, we were all freaking out. And so then in about three weeks, um, we cast a new actor who was, was Kieran Charnock. Um, someone had fallen through the cracks of the initial casting search and Tina Cleary, the casting um, director down in Wellington, recommended him. He did an amazing self-tape uh, in, in her studio or, you know, in their studio. And um, I was like, like, it felt like our film was saved because I remember thinking, yeah. like, we've, gr we've financially, you know, got enough money, I guess, to shoot this film, but we don't have a lead actor. So... Uh, it was like such relief and I really can't imagine the film. It, it seemed like the worst setback to lose, you know, Bueller. But as it turned out, you know, Kieran, uh, who at our world premiere won Best Actor at Moscow, was like so incredible. Yeah. And I can't really, I don't know, it just, I guess the, sometimes these rejection setbacks, it is, you know, people say trust the process and I never understood mm. what that meant. Like a lot of senior people like said, oh, you're just going to trust the process. I'm like, I'm freaking out. What, like, what, what does that mean? But that's an example of how, like, I really believe the film is better because Kieran is amazing in it, yeah. you know? And so um, 
Yeah, you want to talk about the next stuff? Oh, uh, yeah. So, with Greenlit the film, we head down south. Um, now, we based ourselves in Queenstown, which, you know, th th there's an irony because it's considered to be quite an expensive place to go. Uh, it's quite touristy uh, in a part. Uh, so, we went with our coins and our bags of not much money. Um, and I really want to say the reason why we were able to make this film at that cash budget level was because um, our cast and crew and suppliers enabled that to happen by, uh, you know, I guess, uh, just contributing what they did and their talent in any way that they could. Some people worked a day, some people worked a week, some people were on this job for 10 weeks. You know, and I'm not going to give away what the crew rates were, but they were cool, huh? You know, this was not, uh, you're going to pay your mortgage on this bad boy. This was... Heavily reduced wages. Heavily reduced rates. And um, uh, I can't necessarily speak to all of their motivations. Um, a lot of them were our personal relationships. A lot of them were... Uh, the material spoke to them. A lot of them um, had been working in the commercial space for a long, long time and wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, but whatever their motivation was, they just gave and gave and gave. And it was tough. It was freezing. You know, it, it looks like a cold film because it bloody was. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was really a truly awesome experience. And to be the recipient of that uh, give, uh, still continues to be amazing. And they'll be friends for a very long time, for, for lifetime friends, really. Because essentially, you know, all of these people's generosity, be they donors, uh, corporate sponsors, facilities, yeah. and specifically the crew, I mean, they have, you know, launched our careers yeah. as feature filmmakers. It's our first feature film as writer, director, and producer. And so, yeah, we're eternally grateful to those people because had we initially given up and had those people not been so generous or uh, motivated to make something mm. different. I mean, yeah, I guess the thing is everyone had different motivation. I don't, can't speak for all the people. We, so many people worked on the film. I don't, it's not one size fits all. But, you know, like it just, uh, it is an amazing gift. Yeah, and I think uh, one motivation that I, I didn't mention was, um, like Dustin said, uh, my first feature as a producer, Dustin's first feature as writer-director, was also our uh, editor's first feature, our production designer's first feature. First AD. Uh, first AD, you know. Um, it was a big step up for a lot of people, and they were coupled with uber experienced technicians. Like, you know, we're talking about Joe Bollinger and Bindi Crayford level. These guys are like guns. They've been doing it for years. And to have, uh, I guess, new, hungry talent who are experienced in a different space teamed up with that kind of excellence was, uh, was awesome. I mean, Australia's a product of that, really. Mm. So, um, yeah, pre-production and production was... Um, uh, quite a blur, in all honesty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. we basically hired some houses because we couldn't afford to uh, accommodate people in uh, hotels or motels or holiday inns. So we hired a couple of houses and based the production out of a house. Um, we, Dustin, as was mentioned earlier, had been uh, scouting, I think, over the course of Three years. Yeah, three or four years. Yeah, yeah, three or four years. So he knew uh, a lot of the locations that he wanted to shoot in. Um, now, we were based in Queenstown. Where we ended up shooting was... Uh, well, Otimatata was the hero town. Um, we started out in uh, Luggett, which is the sawmill, Alex, Cromwell, Twizel, Otimatata, Wamaru, uh, and then... Uh, the key think, locations, Queenstown. Yeah, yeah, yeah we the, were the there crib, for yeah, three, the three weeks. We shot there, and even just the build of this crib was amazing. I mean, you know, Brett was getting the blooming plumbing going, KJ was up there building the roof. Like, it was a real community effort. Um, I think we had a home oh. quite a bit. I tried. Move I some hopeless. stuff over. Um, but our key location was a crib uh, that was on, on a farm. 
Anyway, production so it was anecdotes. Amazing. We should. So let's get to. So basically, we had our world premiere at Moscow. We all went over there, a massive group. As we said, we were really lucky um, that Kieran was given Best Actor Award because then it ended. As a result of that, amongst other things, um, it got invited to other film festivals. It started mm -hmm. getting on the circuit because it, you know, because as probably you know, like you can spend thousands and thousands of dollars on films festival submission fees. And so that's been helpful in terms of raising interest yeah. in the film. Then we, um, we, so basically the whole time we did not have a distributor or a sales agent. So we basically made the film on spec, hoping that we could somehow find an audience. Um, and what happened was we got into the New Zealand Film Festival and we thought we, we was going to screen six towns, 13 screenings all up. And we thought that that was going to be our mm. only cinema release. Um, so we worked really, really hard, um, you know, largely on social media and, and email comms, to try and get as, to basically sell out as many of those sessions as possible because we made the film for the big screen and we did not have distribution. Um, you know, I mean, basically, the distributors that saw it, although they were complimentary, passed on the film. And um, basically, as a result of, well, we got really lucky because in the lead up just before the festival, our first review was five stars from NZ Herald, and our second review was yeah. five stars from Flix, and then four and a half stars from Dominion Post slash Stuff. And so we were blessed by these, these, these amazing reviews. And then through working hard on social media, it meant we sold out heaps of sessions. We were the first film in Wellington out of 157 films in the Nazif program um, to sell out. So they added a third and that sold out in like a day. And so as a result of that, when that happened, we got a phone call from Limelight, who is our distributor now, saying we want to release this film in cinemas beyond the festival. So then... Just one, th yeah. one note. Um, Going back to our boosted campaign, not only uh, was that uh, kind of uh, financial relationship, but that it that formed the bones of our audience. You know, we had over 400 donors, and uh, we maintained throughout pre-production, production, post-production, post -production, completion. We maintained comms with them, mm. um, and that was a really important thing to do because you just you can't just take people's money and run. Um, and that has built a loyalty. So yeah. we have uh, a, an incredible uh, Facebook following. And yeah. a lot of that is through our core uh, community, which was the cast, the crew, our boosted donors and our investors yeah. um, and suppliers and uh, corporate. So, so, yeah. So even before our film opened in cinemas in October 4, earlier this, like, three weeks ago, and at that point, we already had like 4,000 followers, which is not a huge amount, but if you look at other New Zealand films that get released in cinemas, by the time they've been released in cinemas, they don't have 4,000 followers, a lot of them. Um, Wadu is a massive exception, but in recent mm -hmm. times, they may only have like 500 followers. So, and again, that was kind of by, <laughs> not by design. I mean, essentially, mm -hmm. we didn't, you know, we didn't know anything about social media. <laughs> we didn't and, know anything about anything, actually. <laughs> and so we basically <laughs> were like, well, for the crowdfunding campaign, we should start a Facebook page. And then, then, you know, you are building your audience through doing a crowdfunding campaign. You are starting to build your audience and then word of mouth spreads. Mm. And um, anyway, the, 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 the thing is that with the distribution, the amazing thing that happened in the first week, out of 81 films at the New Zealand box office, we were number 12. Um, Put that in context, 1 through 11 were Walt Disney, Fox, you know, blah, 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 all the studios. So we were the number one independent film or number one art house film at the box office, which uh, for a film that is very art house and is New Zealand, doesn't have famous people in it, um, was really amazing. Um, we've already grossed at the box office in three, three weeks more than was ever projected the film would do in its total life. Um, and I'm, I'm personally very proud to say that mm. um, because we said it from the beginning that we knew there was an audience for this film and I guess I should have started from that thing because it's kind of like my major takeaway no matter what you're making. We didn't make anything in a calculated strategic way. All we did was make the film that we wanted to see. <laughs> Yeah. It was personal, and we cared about it, and we believed that if we made it well, 
that there would be other people like us that yeah. would like it and would turn up. And I think, like, no matter what you're making, all I would say is because we did get a lot of setbacks and stuff and people didn't always believe in us and didn't believe specifically in the marketability of the commerciality of this film, but it's already made more than a lot of films with much bigger budgets that are working in genres that on paper are considered more commercial and safe. Mm. And I really, really think that that's an important thing to take away. That's the only thing really I want people to take away is that if you're deeply passionate and you fight for something and you, and you follow it through, you've got you've to have a higher purpose. We never like, were making this to get into you know, getting five-star reviews and all that stuff. You can't control that stuff. That stuff is completely... Yeah. All you can do is trust your gut and be um, true to your own voice as a filmmaker in the hope that you'll make a great film and that people will turn up, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think, like, I think, you know, it's crazy to me that, like, in Hollywood, I mean, these people spend so much money on market research and exit polls and all this stuff, and yet they continue to make films that are commercial failures. No one knows anything. There's an amazing quote mm. by William Goldman, who wrote Bush Cassidy, and he's like, nobody knows anything. Not one person in the entire motion picture field knows for a certainty what's going to work. That's the reality. No one knows. And... I guess, I don't really know what the takeaway is there. Like, I mean, I just think we work in a really ephemeral, mercurial, like filmmaking is, uh, you can't predict success and everyone has different barometers of that. Yeah. Um, it's so subjective. It's so subjective, yeah. but essentially... Just whatever you do, do it well, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And, and fight for what you believe in and, uh, I don't know. It's I don't a know. good way to finish. I yeah, think. okay. Does anyone have a question? No, they all do. Uh, emotionally, <laughs> financially, what? Uh, primarily financially, but definitely to Yeah. Um, well, I mean, one of the things is like you know, uh, no, no, you know, no one, everyone got coha rates, but you know, Des, myself, and says, and 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 even Ari, the cinematographer, didn't even give us ourselves the nominal wage when we were in production. Uh, I mean, we're not, you know, we didn't make it to make money. I mean, so it's, a, it's a labor of love. It's a passion project that we believe would find an audience. And with, I don't know, I don't know how to say, I don't know. I just, I always believed in the core of my being that we could make a film that would be good, that would be distinctive and unique. And because of that, because it's distinctive and different, the very reason why some people might think it's not worth making is why it should be made, because it's yeah. distinctive and unique. And that people would come for that. Because the thing is, like, it doesn't matter what you do, if you make it excellent, it doesn't matter how niche it is, if you make it fucking good, people recognise that. And also, we were not trying to make a film that was universally... We, we always knew it was going to be a polarising film. I know heaps of people have seen the film that think it's shit. You know, it's because it's not their cup of tea. But the people that like it, love it. And they tell people... And that's why our release is building. Initially, it was going to be five or ten cinemas. Now it's 42, and now we're in event cinemas. This art house film, that trailer you saw, is going to play in multiplex because our screen average is high. How did you eat? It's well, a bloody I mean, good question, mate. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, uh, for me personally, um, and this is the kind of struggle, I think, of producers generally, but certainly emerging ones, is... Uh, you, you've got to pay your bills, you know? And, and we live really frugally, like, you know, no kids. My but, uh, you know, and, and luckily for me, I, you know, I earn my bread working on production, and, uh, which is how a lot of my relationships for Stray have yeah. come through, is through my career in a production sense. Um, but it's taken my attention away from Stray at points, and that's been really hard. And, and that slows down progress. You know, when you want to be doing this, but you've got to do that to do this, it's, it's a really tricky balance, man. Um, but in terms, like, in terms of emotionally, it's definitely the hardest thing I've ever done professionally. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we almost gave up, like, so many a times. A number of times. A number of times, because it all just seems so hard, and we'd never done it before. You know, we just, yeah. like, everything... Okay, now we need to get a distributor. How do we do that? Now we need to get a sales agent. How do we do that? Now we need to... 
do a recruitment waterfall? How do we do that? Like at every point we were learning as we were going. And we um, have spent hundreds of hours oh. on the phone. I mean, it's and, and I, I do want to say the one of the biggest successes of Stray is that our relationship has survived this. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. it's, yeah. I mean, you, you, there's married and then there's like yeah. married. Yeah. And <laughs> we have looked at a problem 20 ways yeah. and, and then the next day gone, oh, actually, have we done the right thing? And um, But through all of it, um, and uh, this is uh, one thing I'm really proud of, is that at every step, I hope that we've operated with integrity and um, Dustin would, would be each other's barometers, I guess, uh, to make sure that that was the, the way forward was. Whatever we did, we did it. And also I think it is important to celebrate the wins. You know, like along the way, because it's always one step forward, or felt like one step forward, two steps back. The day we get crowdfunding greenlit, we lose our actor. Like it, was all, it always mm. felt like you gain one thing and then lose something else. You put out one fire and two others start. But it's important when you hit those milestones, um, like whatever it is, the crowdfunding thing or getting into Moscow, Kieran winning the award is like to actually take a moment just from, a, from a, an emotional camaraderie point of view and celebrate that and go, you know what, like we're, we've got momentum here. It's, you know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. Sorry. Can you please thank Dustin Fennelly and Desiree Armstrong for yeah. sharing their knowledge and experience. Thank you. The Big Screen Symposium is brought to you by Script to Screen and Janda. We would like to thank our event partners, the New Zealand Film Commission, New Zealand On Air, Images and Sound, Screen Auckland and Stage and Screen Travel Services. Voiceover was provided by Samantha Dukes and music by Poddington Bear.